Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemler, and our next guest is a legend from his early iconic role with a leather jacket and his hey line to the sad narcissistic acting teacher, Mr. Cousineau on Barry, and now the publication of his latest book, Alien Superstar, Henry Winkler is truly a national treasure. And he's here to chat with us all about it. Please welcome Henry Winkler. Let's Yay! see. Yay! Sir. You'll notice I have no shame. I'm holding the book up and my my sweater is color coordinated. Would you like me to hold it up too? I would. Just so well, you know why? If there's no why. point, there's no chance it's not in a shot. But look how your shoes go right. Oh yeah, you like it? Oh my God! There it is. Thank you. I did but that here's for you. the thing: uh, this is a brand new character, mm -hmm. and you know we've written Hank Zipser uh, since 2002. How many of those? Uh, there are 28 Hank Zipsers. But uh, this is brand new, uh, Buddy Berger, Alien Superstar. And he got his name because uh, he is, can I tell you the story? Please. Just very, okay. I so, don't have to ask the question, that's great. It is my pleasure. He, is, uh, he lives on a red dwarf planet. At 13, because it's a very, ref, ref, um, uh, re, you know, just a, a, a repressive uh, planet. All of his ability to enjoy art and color and taste and smell is turned off. And uh, they then all become like robots so that they don't make it a problem for the government. Mm. And so his grandmother, Grandma Wrinkle, says, no, you can't, that cannot happen to you. She is the master mechanic of the Starfleet on the Red Dwarf planet, builds a spaceship, and sends him off just before his 13th birthday when he would be turned into a robot. And the only address they know on Earth is Universal Studios. <laughs> Who is going to question a rocket ship landing on the back lot of Universal Studios? And I don't know how this happened, but he gets a job on a situational comedy as an alien on Universal. So we thought, oh, kids love aliens, and they also love thinking about being a star. And so uh, Lynn Oliver, my partner, has written and produced for 11 years, as a matter of fact, on Universal Lot television. I've acted and produced television. And we put a stranger in a strange land because Hollywood is weird. I'll say it. I think uh, adults, while reading it with their kids, will also like the irony there as well, and we'll get that. And you know what we don't write down to the children? Uh, it is uh, the underpinning uh, of the book is body shaming, because the star of the TV show is a biracial young lady whose uh, stage mom wants her, you know, she can have the salad, just not the egg, mm -hmm. because, you know, she's always worried, and it makes children crazy. Yeah. Uh, it is about authenticity, about the, the alien wants to know if they knew who I was for real, would they still accept me? Do you know? And that is a very big challenge for young people um, today, for me. Where did the idea come from to move away from the last series of books that you had been doing? When did you start thinking of Buddy? That was, that's a great question. We thought about it the minute after the publisher said, that's enough of Hank <laughs> Stipser. They, they went, we, you've done it. Uh, we don't think we're going to do any more Hank. And you'd be surprised how that inspires you to come up with a whole new idea. <laughs> Boom. And uh, Lynn and I, we work in her office. Mm -hmm. I sit on the opposite side of her desk. Uh, we hash out, uh, first of all, the idea. You have an idea, and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, and then he could, oh, and then, uh, and what about, or, yeah, well, uh, no. Nah. <laughs> and then you know to throw that story out. And as soon as there's enthusiasm, we start breaking the story down, and uh, we have a contract with uh, Abrams uh, Amulet Books for three novels, and we are in the middle of writing uh, novel number two. So novel number two, but do you remember, I don't want to know who exactly it was that said an alien, Buddy Berger, but how did, where did that come, especially this idea of coming from a repressive planet and sort of coming into the United States as a form of refuge, if right. you will. 
So he is an immigrant. Yes. Oh. We didn't a have refugee. If you yes, will. a refugee, if you will. Uh, and uh, you know what? Uh, it, I, I cannot tell you where that that line was. We knew that aliens, our uh, kids love aliens. Mm -hmm. And I just got my first fan letter from a young man who got an early copy of the book. Henry is his name. I like his name. And Henry said, you know, uh, I've read a lot of alien books, but yours is kind and warm and uh, funny. Uh, and I like him a lot. So that was our first review. That's true. I think for so long, aliens in movies uh, became, uh, they became something threatening. They became a potential war between planets where there was this exactly. period of time in the sort of late 70s to the mid 80s, there were a lot of movies that were about aliens that befriended children and became yes. part of the family, not just E.T. Right. That was the best one of them, but the, the, more convenient, for instance. I have often, and this is no joke, since I was young, I have often thought an alien is going to land on Earth and will land in my vicinity. And I and they will be friendly. And I don't know where the idea came from. I have been oh, I've been fascinated uh, by um, the paranormal. About uh, you know, it, it, I, I I I did a show with uh, Ann Daniels once uh, called Sightings. We did seven years of the study of all things paranormal because I I just loved it. I just always thought, wow, what a great. Um, imagination there is of what's out there. Have you ever seen a UFO or had any sort of experience with? Once my child just transformed. She was so angry, I, I thought, I'm looking at an alien. This can't be real. Yeah, she was 16, or it was yesterday, I, I don't remember. But it's her birthday today. It is my daughter, Zoe, it is her birthday today. Amazing. The mother of three beautiful boys. Uh, August, Jules, and Ace. How many grandkids do you have? I have Those, five. You have five grandkids. We have India, who is a dancer, and Lulu. Uh, Lulu is seven, and oh, just she's amazing. She's an amazing little girl. Oh. She could be six, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, Lulu, if you're watching, I love you, and just because I don't know how old you are means nothing. I, you know, I don't think grandfathers are expected to know the exact age. Say that again, please. Grandfathers are not expected to know the exact age. I so agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Grandfathers are expected to go six, seven, seven. That's what they're supposed really? to do. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Or, oh, you want to go to Target and uh, we'll go on a shopping spree. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because exactly. Don't need to know how old they are. I'm good at that. Go on the shopping spree. Yeah. It's been a pretty amazing uh, few years for you, yes. has it not? I mean, you've been doing these books since 2002, yes. but on top of that in the last few years, yes. you've had incredible success playing Gene Cousineau, Cousineau on, uh, on Barry, an incredible second season. I'm telling also. you, it is a gift in my life. Mm. Uh, I was, uh, my wife and I had just left a, an estate planning meeting. Uh, you know, <laughs> where, where you're going to leave the kids. <laughs> It was really pleasant, and uh, it was also very positive. And we're driving down Ventura Boulevard in the valley, um, uh, just over the hill of, from Beverly Hills, and I got a call. Bill Hader would like to meet you. You're on a short list. I said, is Dustin Hoffman on that list? <laughs> they said, no, why? I said, because if he is, I'm not going, because he's going to get it. Right. And I got the part of this incredible drama teacher. And I have the most incredible acting partners on the show. Um, uh, five of us were nominated for Emmys this year. Congratulations. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that I love about Gene Cousineau, which is something that I like about the whole show, but it really is in his character where it's embodied. On the surface and initially when you meet him, he is narcissistic, he's yes. an out-of-work actor, right. he's um, somewhat self-centered yes. and vain, and then we sort of peel back and see that he's a man who wants to be in love with someone, and he's actually quite good at being in love with someone, and he's a kind partner, and now we're peeling that back even further, and we're seeing him deal with tragedy yes. and grief, and now we're peeling it back even further, and we're seeing him deal with 
possibly revenge. What has it been like to sort of constantly peel the layers back on, on Gene Cusinot? You know what? I, uh, that is an amazing assessment because I don't, I've never thought of it in that way, but exactly what you said is the journey so far of well, my... he's never one thing. He's never just the first thing that and they... And that, that is Alec Berg and Bill Hader, yeah. the creators. I mean, you know, people always say, oh my God, our producers are the best. These men do nine jobs together, combined, and they are perfect at each job. And I am the recipient of the gift of their imagination and intelligence. Mm. So when you get um, some of the scenes that you're getting, I mean... You know how great they are? Yeah. They read Alien Superstar. <laughs> I just thought I'd bring that in again. Oh, really? So was that... <laughs> yeah. I have no pride to notice. No. no. Sell the book, man. Yes, Sell I the book. Look at it at any moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when they give you a scene, uh, I don't have an example off the top of my head, but something much more emotional than I think maybe you've been given as an actor in quite some time. Yeah. When was the last time you had a meaty role like this that you could really sink into that also required you to perform in a very naturalistic way at times? There were parts uh, of other characters I've played, but nothing this um, complete and intense, mm -hmm. nothing this um, tangential in so many ways, this one character and all of his, his um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the facets of him, are, it's just a gift. Cass, were you were you prepared for a role like that? Did you feel like you had been preparing your whole life you for know, a role I, like that? Or did it feel like, oh, okay, I haven't done something like this in a while? Well, that I feel every time I get work. Right. Uh, I audition, I want it, I work for it, I get the part, and then I say to myself, why did you just say yes? Because you don't know how to do your job anymore. Mm -hmm. you don't, I don't know how to act anymore. I have that same fear that everyone has. And then you realize that the anticipatory fear is worse than the actuality. Yep. I trained myself because I knew that um, I, wa I didn't want to be a flash in the pan. And You mean I, early in your career change? Early in my career. Yeah. I went to, to uh, college and then I went to graduate school. I really tried to solidify uh, knowing parts of my art, if, if not working on it, so that I could keep going, just put one foot in front of the other. And so I think I am prepared. I think I was prepared. It just is that fear creeps in, and you have to beat it into submission. Yeah. Um, when, did you meet, uh, when did you meet Lynn Oliver? Uh, 2002, we met in a restaurant on Gower. Uh, Gower is a street at the end of which is Paramount Studios. Uh, it used to be uh, Cowboy Gulch, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gower. Uh, it is where uh, Republic, uh, the famous movie studio, would shoot all their westerns. You would tie your horse up right there on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, I bet the, you were a big fan of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, weren't you? I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. Just based off of this sort I, of like I Los Angeles memory. Brad Pitt memory. was amazing. Yeah. Because Brad Pitt uh, played this character that was completely subservient to Leo and never got out of his lane. He never tried to show up Leo. He never tried to um, make himself more important. I, this is the way I earn my living. I work for this guy, and I do whatever he does, and I go on the roof and take off my shirt, and my wife melted into butter <laughs> in the seat next to me. I'm not, I, I used her for the popcorn. Uh, I'm not, he took a shirt off, and ba boom, he was gone. <laughs> Just that was amazing. Did you love the uh, sort of nostalgia for old LA and like the restaurants and the neon signs and all that? Do you know what I did? My wife lived there. She was born and raised there. I was born uptown here in, in New York. Well, you've been in LA since what, the late uh, 1974. 70s? 74. Wow. Yes, uh, I moved there in September, uh, September 18th, 1973, to be precise. Uh, but you never get New York out of your body. I've never gotten New York out of my soul. Um, 
but I have always thought about I am sorry that I missed some of the original Hollywood, mm. you know, with those parties and, uh, and just what was going on at that time. It doesn't <laughs> seem that that was the same as now. Yeah. Uh, one of the people that, speaking of... Uh, Old Hollywood, not necessarily old Hollywood, but really a Hollywood legend that you dedicate your book to is Gary Marshall. Yes. Did that have anything to do, was that just because you learned everything from him, as you say in there, or did that have anything to do with Alien Superstar itself and the story that you were telling? Uh, Gary Marshall uh, and uh, Tom Milkus and, uh, and Tom Miller, Eddie Milkus and Tom Miller were the three, the triumvirate, who produced and created and... Uh, sold and then went on to uh, watch over Happy Days mm -hmm. for the next 10 years. And they gave me my life in Hollywood. Yeah. Gary was my mentor. I learned everything about working on the set, about behavior, about being an executive producer um, from them, from Gary. And then uh, Gary's wife, Barbara, a very majestic woman, gave me a tie of Gary's when he passed away, which I wore as Gene Cousinow uh, on Barry. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that yeah. was, that's Gary Marshall's tie. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the uh, lavender tie that I wear in the second season. What made you choose that tie, and did you ask? I did not choose the you tie. You didn't choose the tie. No, it was given to me as a keepsake uh, of Gary. But I mean, I mean, in terms of choosing it for the character. Oh, I knew I would do that. Uh, it, it could have been, uh, it could have been like pads of butter on it, you know. It could have been a frying pan. I would have done it um, because I thought, oh, I'm paying homage in the smallest way. And did you tell Bill and Alec that that's where the tie was from, and that was why you wanted you know, to wear it? No, I do, I didn't say that's because I wanted to, I wanted to wear it. I just said this is where it's from. I might have told them this is where it's from. But I, I did, I, I, the, the costume uh, designer, I did ask her permission if I could wear it as part of my costume. And uh, she immediately said yes. Now, is that because you were given the tie uh, and happened to be working on the show sort of just after Gary Marshall's passing or not long after Gary Marshall's passing? Or did, does uh, Gene Cousineau have some sort of affiliation in your mind with Gary Marshall, or is there some sort of cyclical nature? No, I don't even know if uh, Gene Cousinow could have auditioned for Gary Marshall. <laughs> but that is such a great idea. I don't know if I was not doing the character, would I, have, would I have worn the tie in the first place or just kept it in my closet, you know, um, uh, just kept it in my sight. Do you think it may have... I'm playing armchair psychiatrist here, excuse That's me. That's okay with me. Do you think it may... <laughs> Do you think it may have something to do with the fact that the Gary Marshall was responsible for really the sort of most prominent 10 years of your career, gave you your career, as you said, taught you everything about the business, and now at this point in your life, you're doing this show where you're getting nominated for awards. It's probably being seen by more than other, sh like other shows since Happy Days, that it felt like an appropriate time to... No, sort of I, I didn't put that together, but yes to all of that. Now that you have said that... Yes to that. That that sounds <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. That it, it is appropriate. Um, that I have the platform in order to do that in the very smallest way to say, um, Gary, you are with me, because um, he was a wonderful friend, uh, was a wonderful teacher, and a wonderful creator. Uh, just that is just the truth. If you went to Gary Marshall, <laughs> Gary Marshall uh, runs a theater. Uh, he, he ran a theater, and they've named it the, uh, the Gary Marshall Theater. It was called the Falcon mm -hmm. Theater after the gang that uh, the Fonz belonged to. Um, but it is a, a, a wonderful small 99-seat house uh, in uh, North Hollywood uh, that his family keeps uh, going, does children's theater in the afternoon. It, and his office was there filled with memorabilia of everything that he did. The movies and the television shows and his scripts and props. And when you went to visit him, there was a line out the door of young people, young writers, young actors, young creators who wanted to sit at the feet of the, of the mind of Gary Marshall. And he 
was enormously generous with his information and his time. What made him different? What made him, what made you want him to be your mentor outside of he was your boss on happy days, but what was it about seeing him that said, okay, I need to follow this man and learn from him. It was not a decision. Mm. It was seeing him, watching him. I, I tell the story that sometimes on, uh, on happy days, you know, they would, it, it's hard to write. It, at that time you did 23, 24 yeah. episodes, 26 sometimes. A lot of writers. A lot of writers. There were 21 writers in the room from uh, the age of 21 to 77. Uh, Gary just thought life experience was really important. But when you had trouble with a joke, and you called Gary, he would come to the set, and you would go, oh, I don't know. Listen, uh, you could do this. Uh, you could do that. And he would tilt his head, and 55 solutions would fall off the top. <laughs> and then you had a problem. They were all great. Which one do you choose? He, he, he was an amazing human being. Uh, he was, uh, in this body, uh, a, a person who didn't make a left turn. He would drive all the way around a block just not to make a left turn. <laughs> he, his, his, um, I don't know if that's a, a metaphor, if that's something that he actually did. No, he actually did oh, okay. that. Uh, his pasta sauce was ketchup. Uh, you know, yeah, a little ketchup is nice. And he would uh, wear a bib because he would get it all over the place, you know. <laughs> but people followed him like a guru. You, you, so in his presence, I learned, here you are, hmm. you know. Um, uh, Tom Miller, uh, who lives in Connecticut now, um, a brilliant man in his own right, a completely different um, personality, completely different um, intellect. Uh, I learned a lot from him too, and Eddie Milkus. Uh, now, with 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 Lynn Oliver, you you meet her in two thousand two. Is this a random happening that you meet her, or are you meeting people to potentially write a book with? No, I never thought of writing a book. Uh, I've told this um, story. I am dyslexic. Uh, I did not think I could write a book. Uh, a young man by the name of Alan Berger, who is now an, an agent out in uh, in Hollywood, said to me he was my manager for 30 days. And then the company he worked for imploded. So I went for a meeting and they were taking the art off the wall. And he said, write books for children about your learning challenges. And I said, no way. I, I believe I'm stupid. Uh, no way I could write a book. The second time he said it, he said, I'm gonna introduce you to Lynn Oliver. We met, we hatched Hank Zipser. And 35 novels later, Alien Superstar comes out. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, um, uh, really, uh, it, it is uh, amazing. So here's what I've learned, if I can just. Please. You don't know what you are able to accomplish until you put one foot in front of the, uh, in front of the other and you just try. So my mantra for years was, if you will it, it is not a dream. If you will it, it is not a dream. My mantra now is, I will try. What do you, there we go. What do you, uh, what do you, what do you want to try next? What do I want to try now? Well, I want to get the third season of Barry right. We start in March. Uh, they're writing it now. I have no idea. Uh, Bill, the only thing he shared with me which gave me great uh, comfort and confidence, he said, wow, we wrote ourselves right into a corner. Really did. But he's done that, in a, but he's done that, that at the end of every season, yeah. I've thought. Wow, I have no idea where to go. <laughs> so I said, well, do I wear camouflage now and carry a gun? I don't know. He said, no, I don't think so. So I know I'm not carrying a gun. <laughs> That's it. But York, but and forgive me, I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened at the end. Haters care, Barry doesn't know that. That I know. That you know. No, but uh, Stephen Root, uh, uh, who's also yeah. up for a, uh, an Emmy, Stephen Root was an, uh, an incredible acting partner in the last um, episodes of the second season. 
oh my gosh, he took me on an emotional roller coaster to oh, try to kill me. But he whispers something in my ear. I, I, I'd rather not say if people are catching up with the, uh, the, the season two of Barry on HBO. <laughs> but, oh, I just went to Katz's, you know, and I had a, uh, a pastrami sandwich, half and half, half fatty, half lean. I, I just belched. Okay. So, <laughs> I am now sitting in, in a haze of pastrami <laughs> and uh, deli mustard right now. I just, oh my God, what a bubble. Okay. Uh, but it seems like, there. well, he is painted in a corner or has written into a corner because Barry doesn't know there's a lot of places they can go with Mr. Cusino who can start playing psychological games with Barry and messing with him. Hey, yeah, kind let's of, write him. Sort em. of torturing him. Let's write him. But you know what, Bill and Al... Tell Hater that came from this guy. I, you know what, I'm going to. But they are, they are an extra, extraordinary. Now, Bill has won, you know, two Emmys, at least that I, in my lifetime, in my lifetime with him. Alec has been nominated. He said, the nominations and losses that I have accrued for Emmys is now of drinking age. Has he never won? He has never won this genius. For Seinfeld or Silicon Valley or Barry? Uh, apparently, uh, for the individual uh, writer, I don't think that uh, he's won. He's lost a lot. Wow. Uh, well, we have a question coming in from Twitter. It's, yes. If you had to reprise any of your roles and play them for another 10 years, which one would you pick? Well, I, I would like to stick with uh, Gene. Yeah. I hope that goes for a while. Eight more years on but that. But, you know, I, I love them all. Uh, Barry, the uh, uh, Zuckercorn, the lawyer on Arrested Development, was crazy. I said the craziest things I think I've ever said as an actor. If I played the Fonz now as a grandfather, you know... Teaching the little ones, uh, I, that would be fun. Would you do that if they, if they, if they were like? No. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. this is a hypothetical question from a person in the in the high fear. I mean, you alluded to what sounded like some sort of old age happy days reunion. So I'm right. No. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't I'm ask. A, I'm a modern guy. <laughs> no, but I, I loved playing him. He yeah. was so much fun, really. Uh, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Saperstein was fun, mm -hmm. you know, um, having uh, Jenny Slate and Ben Schwartz as children. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. On, uh, on Parks and Rec. Oh, those two never did the same thing twice. I don't know how they chose... Uh, what they used on television, but they never repeated themselves. For better or worse? Uh, I, I think only for better. Yeah. I think only for better. I mean, Ben Schwartz has one of the fastest yeah. improvisational minds um, uh, anywhere outside of the Congo. Uh, <laughs> where, they're, where they're known very much for improvisation. You know that comedy clubs are big. Huge in the Congo, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but there you go. Also very influenced by Del is. Close you know what's there big as in well. The Congo? Alien, Alien superstar. I, um, it's unbelievable. Is it on shelves now? It is on shelves tomorrow. Tomorrow. Is this on the air right now? This is on the air right now, but okay, people will tomorrow, be able to see October it October 1st. Well. Tomorrow. It's Zoe's birthday today. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday, Zoe. Thank you. And it's the book's birthday tomorrow. First birthday. Yeah, it's the pub date. Now, is that's Buddy... They, that's so uh, technical. The publication date. The pub date. Uh, we have a couple more questions from the audience, right? Hey. Right here. Hi. Hi. What is your name? Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. Nice to meet you. Are you a teenage witch? <laughs> I'm a little older. I but. directed that show. <laughs> Did you really? Okay. Oh, Sabrina, I'm just going to interrupt you for a minute. Yeah. So this, there was a, a co-star on the show when I directed it, and she brought a friend of hers who was 17 from Texas. Mm -hmm. And this young person so just oozed this gigantic energy. I put her in as an extra, wow. Kelly Clarkson. Oh, wow. Wow. 
Yeah, and now I'm, I'm going to do her talk show in a couple of weeks. You are going to do her talk yeah. show. Oh, wow. Are you going to sing? No, no, no. I wish I could. If I could sing, I wish I could sing like uh, Brandy Carlisle or Sia. Or if there is There's reincarnation. Uh, please do yeah, a I'm coming, Sia I'm coming back song. as the boss. <laughs> uh, Sabrina, hi. Hi. <laughs> Which Sia song would you sing if you had to sing? A, would I it be? would sing um, uh, Gasoline Meet, Meets Fire. Or Fire Meets Gasoline. Do you know that song? Amazing. Do you know that song? No. Nope. I'm assuming it's right because I don't want to say you're wrong. Okay. You can <laughs> say I'm wrong, but look it up. Okay. It's extraordinary. Okay. okay. I, I just wanted but to if a Sia song didn't... No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Go ahead, Sabrina. I'm sorry. <laughs> but when, when you hear people... <laughs> when you hear people... Sabrina, we're going to get to you in a second... I swear to you, no, but when I'm gonna you, run this bit into the ground. You're not going. You're not talking. But when when you hear people like Brandy Carlisle, uh, uh, Ben Platt, you know, who starred down the street here, and Evan Hansen has a, an album, and there's a, a a song called Bad Habits. When you hear these people sing, or Sia, or the Boss, they need to sing. They're not just singers to be stars. They cannot. Do anything else <gasps> kills me. Sabrina, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. I I just wanted to tell you I loved you in the movie Holes. Did you hear that? Yeah. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> Thank my, you. You're welcome. My question is, what was your most rewarding experience co-writing um, Alien Superstar? You know what? Um, I I'm not kidding. I draw. I live like in Santa Monica. Lynn's office is in West Hollywood. So it takes me a good 40 minutes to drive there in the morning. Yeah, that's a big commute. During that 40 minutes, I'm thinking, what are we going to write today? I have no idea what we're going to write. And we start with, and now it's on a computer, but we start with a blank page. And by the time I leave her office, there are six to eight pages that never existed before that just came as we are writing this book together. And it is so unbelievably rewarding and touching every single day. And then at the end, there is a real book. I, I, don't, I, I don't even know how to put that into words. Next question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's Next question right here. Hi, Henry, long-time fan from Australia. Hi, you know that the name of my production company is Fair Dinkum. Well, I was in Alice Springs. I heard the phrase. It means genuine article. Wow, you're Fair Dinkum, or it's Fair Dinkum Cotton, Fair Dinkum um, Cashmere. Yeah. I'm a liar. This is like 90%. <laughs> yes, my darling, what is your name? Carmel. Hi. Did you fly in from Australia just for this interview? That's amazing. That Thank you so, so much for doing that. that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm a teacher in Australia, and I just wanted to know, as a dyslexic, if you were a student in my class, what is the one thing you'd like me to know as your teacher? Okay. I think that is a brilliant question. We are known as troublemakers. We're known as comedians. We're known as lazy. We're known as not trying as hard because we're so verbal or we're so good um, socially or we're so good in so many different ways. How could you not know this yet? How could you? I've explained it so often. It really is difficult. I cannot spell. I am going to be 74 on the 30th of October. I cannot spell the word schedule. I can say it, but I can't sound it out. So I have schedule um, typed on a card above my computer because I use it so often. We are not joking. We are not playing around. We are not trying to get sympathy. We can't do it. Whatever that it is. And to just understand that it is difficult to just understand, not you're going to get it by the end of the year, not that, um, uh, just to look us in the eye and say, you know what, I know it's hard, you're going to be great. 
It, this, how you learn has nothing to do with how brilliant you are. Um, there we go. Uh, one more. Hi, uh, Henry. Uh, my name is Doug. I'm a big fan. I love Thank Barry. You, Doug. Thank you. Um, if you could play any role, have your dream role on Broadway or um, on Hollywood, what would it be? Well, I, I would like to, uh, to be back on, on Broadway. It is so exciting, I can't tell you. The last time I was on Broadway, it opened and closed in seven nights. Sandy the Storm came in and completely wiped out our viewership, uh, the audience. Before that, I was on for nine months with John Ritter, the great late uh, John Ritter, and Len Cariou and, and, uh, uh, and Penny. I, it, was just, it was just unbelievable. I'd like to do that. What role I would like to play a mute. I would like to tell a story with using my entire except for my words. I've thought about it a long time. I don't know why. I don't know why. I want to see if I can do that. Henry, I love when you stop by. You nice know what? Man. This was a great conversation. Oh, thank you. You make it very easy. Alien uh, Superstar is on shelves tomorrow, October Have I shown 1st. you the cover? Happy birthday, Zoe. Zoe. Henry Winkler, everybody. Thank you.